This talk that I'm giving is kind of a trial run for the SauceCon talk. I highly recommend people go to SauceCon. It is one of my favorite conferences. It is a user conference, but it is one of the least user conferency of the user conferences because we're all there to try and help you become better automated testers because if you're better at automated testing, you're going to get more out of our product at Sauce Labs. How many people here are not Sauce Labs users? OK. Who here does not know what Sauce Labs is? OK. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome to Sauce Labs. Sauce Labs essentially allows you to pick your browser operating system combination and run your tests remotely on our uh, hardware so that you don't have to maintain all of that stuff yourself. And we've got a lot of people on my team. I am a senior solution architect here. I've been here two and a half years now. Uh, that means I get to take a look at other people's code, do code reviews. I get to do framework assessments. I get to do a lot of training and walking through best practices and framework. Um, you know, crafting and intro to Selenium, advanced Selenium, CI, CD, parallelization, mobile, all sorts of fun things. Uh, before I joined Sauce Labs, I was a, a software development engineer and test at five different companies. So part of this talk is I have done a lot of these things in the past and I know why you shouldn't do them because I ran into problems using them in certain ways. And so a lot of this stuff is based on my personal experience. Um, I'm also uh, one of the core contributors to Selenium Project. I write the Ruby code. Um, and also, I'm the project lead for Water, which is a test library based on top of Selenium. Um, so if anyone wants to talk Selenium-specific things or Ruby-specific things, definitely hit me up after. All right, ground rules. My opinions are correct. I have too many opinions. Part of that means that I'm not going to get to explain all of my opinions. So some of them will just have to take on faith. Um, and the final thing, if you're agreeing with everything I'm saying, you're probably not paying enough attention. Because hopefully there's going to be at least something that you're going to be, no, that doesn't quite sound right. And then we can have an argument about or a polite conversation about it later. And uh, it will be fun. All right, so a couple things that I'm trying to Speak to ahead of time because it's going to come up throughout the rest of this talk. Automated testing is fundamentally different from manual testing. And I think this is something that a lot of the industry is still kind of grappling with and a lot of the different ways that people are talking about the right ways to do testing. Computers aren't humans. They aren't as good as humans at certain things. And so if we're trying to use them the same way that we use humans, we're not going to get the same benefits. And so we need to find a way to get value from what computers do without trying to pretend that they're humans. I am a big proponent of not doing everything in UI tests, doing more at the unit test level, doing more with integration tests, doing more with APIs, doing, doing the things that make sense to do at a lower, more reliable level at that lower, more reliable level than to try and do absolutely everything in the UI. Also a big proponent of atomic, autonomous, and short. And this has been the mantra at Sauce Labs for years. It's focus on one specific thing at a time, be able to run them independently in any combination or order, and uh, at the same time, completely independently. And then you want to keep them short so that they're not long running tests. And Second thing is anyone who has put together any kind of framework and written any kind of framework, maintained any kind of test suite knows that by far the most expensive part of that process is the maintenance costs. Creation costs, not as much. Execution costs, not as much. You're going to spend most of your time and resources working on maintenance. And so with everything, with all my recommendations, with everything I'm talking about, it's how can we reduce maintenance costs? How can we optimize? for not spending as much time maintaining code going forward. Even if that means investing a little bit more time up front. Uh, and then just in general, always prefer simple or clear to something that's easier or faster. In the long run, you're going to thank yourself for structuring it that way. Because if everyone can look at something and just kind of understand what's going on pretty, pretty easily, it's a lot better than, hey, I can write this code in one line instead of three kind of things, if, it, those, if that approach makes it less clear or less 
obvious. All right, these are the things I'm going to try and get to. We'll see how we do. All right, the pit of success. Uh, I had a friend uh, use this term, and I like, had to go online and find, it, find out about it. And essentially, it's this idea where most software that's out there, especially in Selenium land, is kind of ad hoc put together. And someone, someone has an idea of this is how this needs to look. And if you don't follow exactly the way that they had it in mind to use, you would fall into the pit of failure. So like there's one narrow path of success, and anything you do to get off that path, you fail. So the goal is to try and turn that around and create a pit of success, where you have to try hard not to succeed with it. Um, and that means having conventions. Problem with conventions, if you make them too constricting, people are going to have to find complicated workarounds. If you make them too permissive, then people are going to ignore them. So it's a balance that has to be done. Uh, and I, another thing that I see often is people will optimize the most common actions or path or something like that, which makes everything that's not the most common that much harder to do. Um, and I'm not going to get into examples of those. Um, whenever you're writing framework code or page object designs, you have to constantly be thinking, how are the people that are going to use this going to abuse it? Because people will take what you've put and do crazy things that are really bad and going to cause problems that you didn't anticipate. So part of the pit of success is to make it hard for them to abuse it. And that's, that's something that I don't think enough people really keep in mind. That, like, I'll talk to people like, oh yeah, I've got this really complicated setup, but it's working really well for us, and everything is, is, is working great. I'm like, OK, that's great. What happens when you leave the company? Like, very frequently, whenever the architect of a framework leaves the company, that company scraps that framework. That is very frequent, because there was one guy who had one vision with one way of doing it, and he made everyone else follow his, his way. And when he left, everyone else looks at them, and does this make sense to you? No, does it make sense to you? No, all right, well, let's move on to some, let's do JavaScript. <laughs> all right, <clears throat> moving on. So what is page object pattern? Most people are familiar with this. Uh, an object-oriented class that stores information about a specific view in the application's user interface. Uh, it includes element locations and actions. This can be a whole page. It could be a mobile application. It can be a, just a modal. It can be some section on the page. Uh, so just because it's a page object doesn't mean it has to be a page, an entire page, or anything like that. There's lots of flexibility um, that still follows this model. What are we trying to solve with page objects? Again, maintenance. We're trying to make sure that the amount of time that you spend dealing with failures and dealing with changes in the code are not taking up too much time. Separation of concerns making sure that the things are where they need to be and dry proper abstractions. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Place for everything and everything in its place. Obviously, it was Benjamin Franklin because it was popularized in the late 18th century. And everything interesting that was said in the late 18th century was said by Benjamin Franklin. All right, abstract all the things. There is. A community that's against page objects because they say that page objects do not abstract enough. They're not following single responsibility principle because your elements and your methods are on the same page, and that's horrible. Uh, because, because, um, and the idea is like, oh yeah, you keep your your classes small by just having a lot more of them. Then there's the other side that complains about page objects because they're too. Abstracted. Yagni. Anyone know what Yagni stands for? You ain't going to need it. Don't over abstract. Don't spend time creating things that you're not going to need. And this is, this is where becoming a good uh, test automation engineer comes in handy because there are certain things, certain patterns you're going to see at different places that you work where, ah, I kind of know where this is going and I have an idea of what's going to be a good abstraction to make ahead of time. But you definitely don't want, I've 
seen it all from people like, let's identify every single element on this page. I'm sure we're going to use them at some point to let's, you know, like make sure, let's give each element its own class. Like it can get really ridiculous. Uh, so don't, the idea is don't over abstract. And so the, even the idea of bringing and identifying elements outside of the one method they're getting used in is too much. So if you're not using that element more than one place, you should keep it in uh, the one method that it belongs in. So I like page objects because I feel like page objects, the way that they typically are implemented, fall right in the middle of this in a nice sweet spot of why are we creating an extra class when pretty much whenever we want to know that, hey, someone's made a change to the reservation system. Let's go to the reservation you know, creation class and then make those changes in that one class. And maybe, maybe an element locator was changed. Maybe the action had to be, had to be tweaked in some fashion. Uh, it's all right there. You don't have to switch between multiple classes. And also, the idea that if you have a convention where all of your elements locations are at the top and then all of your actions are down below, it's, it's not like it's that difficult to keep those separate. It also encourages you to keep your Encourage might be the wrong word. I encourage you to keep your page objects small, which means if you start seeing really long page objects when you're doing it this way, you probably should be trying to find ways to break it up into smaller pieces in some fashion. You probably have too many things on one page that you're trying to emulate at the same time in the same class. All right, so probably the single biggest argument against page objects is this idea that page objects don't do a good job of representing user intent. So this is where you've got your screenplay, where you're going to follow an actor. You've got some kind of flow pattern where you've got some controller that's moving you through different page objects. Uh, you'll even see this with BDD a lot, where it gets very, and I'll, I'll speak to some of this uh, when we get to imperative versus declarative. But It kind of, so I have in the past, in addition to page objects, implemented a, a site class or an application class that does some of the bigger picture things. I want to authenticate a user with an API. That doesn't belong in a page object, things like that. So I'm doing some things like that, but I'm not trying to emulate a flow of a user in the UI. The more we can get away from thinking like a manual tester where we are going to start at the beginning and then navigate through everything and make an assertion at the end, the better our test suites are going to be. So I am thinking, what is the best way to evaluate the proper DOM to database functionality quickly and at scale? The longer your tests are, the more you're trying to do in the UI instead of um, at a lower level, the more you're trying to do, the less you're leveraging your APIs for various things, the harder it's going to be to really scale up and get the, the rapid. How many people here have their, at their company are trying to do continuous delivery? All right, who here, who here does not, has, has a manager that hasn't said anything about continuous delivery in the last month? Two, all right. I, I joke that, um, my joke is that you shouldn't try and uh, implement continuous delivery until you're at least 90% agile. No one? All right. 90% uh, agile doesn't mean anything because you can't be a percent of a process. Uh, as you're moving to continuous delivery, you need to be able to provide results to developers very quickly. That means scaling, that means running in parallel, that means focus tests. Most of this conversation is how are we going to improve that, not how are we going to be more like manual testers. All right, who here uses the Java, or uh, I guess C Sharp has one as well, uh, use the page factory? Oh, last time I did this was half the room, all right. Couple quotes from the people who, who created and implemented it uh, in Java and C Sharp. Um, that, that, that's, I'm not going to get into the whys of that. We'll just leave that one where it is. So, all right. First thing I want to talk about is imperative versus declarative. Who here has heard of these terms before? 
a few. All right, great. Here's an example of something imperative. I'm using, this is still with a page object model type of a thing. This is Ruby, so hopefully it's somewhat easy to read. But the idea is you are specifying all the things you're doing. You're referencing a driver with the methods on the driver. You've got a page object, but then we're, we're calling to get an element back, and then we're taking an actual click on the, that element. We're doing a specific weight, sending exact uh, data values, passing those in, things like that. Here's the same thing in a declarative manner. Visit the sign in page, sign in with a valid user, expect to be signed in. I'm not getting on an anti, how many people do BDD here? Cucumber, JBHave, any of those fun things? All right, I'm not getting on a rant against that today. But the idea that why do you need necessarily natural language conversion if you keep your tests looking like this. Your manager shouldn't need English. If he wants to actually look at it, which most people who write BDD, no one actually looks at it. This, this should be good enough, and this is how we should be thinking about doing it in the first place. So there are a number of things that encourage imperative design, which I speak against lightly. Um, Keyword-driven testing is kind of the robot thing where you're trying to, how many people are familiar with robot framework? Couple, yeah, a lot of Python people tend to do, uh, do robot stuff. I don't enjoy it as much because it tends to encourage imperative. Uh, and I, actually, let me step back and talk about imperative versus declarative. Imperative is the walking through the specific details of what exactly you're doing. I am taking this action, I'm doing this next thing, and you're giving kind of a recipe of exactly what to do. Declarative is like, let's focus on the business logic the important thing, and let's abstract all of the details, all of the things that you, we need to have a specific, a particular object to, that has particular methods to do particular things that are independent of what our business reasoning is, and let's put that somewhere else. We're trying to keep a big picture. There are a number of things in the industry that kind of force us to stay detail-oriented detail and prevent us from abstracting things. Uh, Data-driven testing is another one, again, something that a lot of BDD uh, people will misuse. I don't know if you've seen like the scenario outlines where you've got like this huge table of data and you can't parse any of it. Good thing it's in natural language, right? Nightwatch.js, Site Prism, Selenite, these are kind of some frameworks that kind of encourage, have custom matchers that, that end up calling specific methods on the driver instead of abstracting that, that logic away. Um, I've also seen someone make a page object alternative that was, uh, everything was in property files in Java. And it was kind of an interesting, took a look at it, it's kind of some interesting stuff there. But again, in order to really leverage that, you had to put all of that logic in the test itself. All right. Deterministic versus non-deterministic. A Selenium meetup here in San Francisco a year and a half ago, there was someone that stood up on stage and said, this is the right way to do it. So this is the idea of you're using the same page object for both mobile and desktop, and you're gonna use a conditional to decide which path you're gonna go down. Hey, if we see the mobile element, do the mobile things. If we don't see the mobile element, do the desktop things. Which is great until, oh, that mobile element just didn't show up in time and now we're down the wrong path. And so you've introduced the possibility of a non-deterministic approach to your test. It's not going to be the same necessarily all the time. And maybe, maybe you know in this one instance it's gonna be fine, but what about when you're using that pattern everywhere? Because once you use a pattern in one place, you, everyone copies it again. How are your users gonna abuse it? Aha, I see, saw that one guy do it over here. I'm gonna do it everywhere. Even though it's a fine thing to do, don't do it if people are going to abuse it in other places. Uh, so yeah, so it opens up synchronization uh, problems. Uh, the other thing I like to say is your test already knows. It's not like it's a question of what, are you on a mobile test or are you on a desktop test? We decided this at the beginning of the test. Either there's some configuration value that we can check or the driver itself. Are you an Appium driver? Are you a a Selenium driver, like we have that information available. There's, there's zero reason for us to be checking the state of our system, but I see it happen constantly. All right, inheritance 
uh, or implementations for, for our statically typed people um, and not conditional. So this is how I would do it in Ruby because Ruby's awesome. I would just use some metaprogramming where I would just, it would just automatically pull which one I want. I want, I want the mobile home page, I want the desktop home page, and I don't have to do any conditionals because it's magic. In Java, we have to do something. There we go. A Java approach or another approach, this, this is still Ruby code, but it's kind of showing what you could do in Java, is you have some kind of environment variable at the beginning that sets what you're going to do, and then you just require the classes in a different directory that are the ones you want. So you've got a Selenium home file, and you've got an Appium home file. They're both subclass to the common, something along these lines. Uh, in general, as we're moving towards continuous delivery, as we're moving to, to, toward that approach, the thing that we see with a lot of companies that are doing that successfully, they tend to have the trunk-based de uh, development, they tend to have the mono repos and the microservices. I'm not gonna dig into any of those. The key takeaway from this is prefer fewer repositories to more repositories. If you can combine things into one repository, you should. That doesn't mean necessarily the code has to be all coupled, but you're going to have a lot of duplication potentially if you are trying to implement separate repos for your mobile tests and your desktop tests, which I have seen, I've actually done. Uh, but this is a way that you can, uh, without having to put conditionals everywhere. I've seen, yeah, way too more. So, right, so as we're moving towards a monorepo, prefer fewer repositories, integrate, uh, ideally, your application code and your testing code all live in the same place and they're version controlled together. Uh, ideally, you can have a lot of reuse because especially for the tests, a lot of, like whether it's an, a phone app or a desktop app, both of them are probably sending the same JSON blobs to the same REST client for especially a lot of single page apps today, uh, there's gonna be a lot of the, you're gonna be logging in on both. And the things, like what the text of the test is gonna look like for logging in might be exactly the same. In fact, that's one way to think about am I being sufficiently declarative in my test writing is can, does the same business logic work for both my phone as my desktop? And it's not always gonna be the same, but often it is. Oh, man, I've seen some page objects that are just thousands of lines long and they're just conditional after conditional after conditional. So anything you could do to remove conditionals, I, I like to say conditionals are bugs. Like you really, if you've got a conditional, you really need to make sure that you want that there because default to it being a bug and you should find some way to pull from a, a, a hash map or something like that or pull from a configuration file dynamically or subclass or implement an interface or something along those lines rather than constantly having to check the condition of various things. All right. This happens a lot. A lot of people come up with the use case of, I want to check to make sure that this element isn't there. Here's three examples here. So let's, let's check for the absence of an element. So we're going to expect this element not to exist. All right, it doesn't exist. That's great. Oh wait, it exists right now, it just was gonna go away in a second. Like, oh, okay, well, we need a sleep five then. We need to like, you end up having to put in some kind of hard-coded sleep to make sure that for sure it's not there. That's not ideal. I've seen this a lot. We want to always be looking, and this is, this is I'm, I'm showing this in, uh, in test code. It applies the same in page object code. Make, you always want to find something that you can positively identify as there rather than looking for the absence of something on the page. It's a little different if it's a REST call or some kind of API interaction, but in the UI, if you can find something to positively locate, it's much better than trying to find that something is not there. All right, coupling page objects. The traditional page object model has calls for every method in the page object to return an instance of another page object. So it looks something like this. We're gonna initialize a home page, and then we're gonna follow sign in, and that's gonna give us a sign in page instance. We're going to 
follow sign up. That's going to give us a sign up page instance. We're going to sign up on the sign up page, and that's going to give us a home page, and then we're going to be logged in. So what are, what, are, what, are, what are your users of your framework going to do with this? I can do that. Because everything's better on one line. And yeah, you can see, and I've even, there was, a, there was someone at a Selenium conference a few years ago that uh, his whole talk was on how you can write this in a way that you can write some kind of English language kind of thing in this. And I'm just like, all right, yeah, what happens when you, when you have some null point, like Java, like you have a null point, you know, like, hey, you've, you've got this all on one line. There's, there's a lot of issues that could come up, and it's not necessarily obvious what's going on. And this is like a really good example of, this is fine. People are going to do this with it, which is less fine. And this isn't that much harder to do. In fact, I would argue that this gives you a little bit more clarity as to what's going on, which, again, we should be preferring where pretty much you just initialize everything that you need in the order you're doing. This is the exact same kind of thing. It's not even any more lines of code in this particular instance, but it's giving you the same information in a more straightforward way without making sure that your page objects are coupled. Um, I coupled my page objects at the second company I worked at, and. Uh, I was all excited to get it all working out just right. And then it turned out we had the same, the same code was being used in different contexts. And so I had a sign-in page object, which was great, except for when you were signing in from the login page, it pulled up that modal, and then it would take you back to the, the so landing page. But if you were doing it from the cart, it would take you back to the cart. And so, all right, are we implementing different methods then on this? Are we creating separate class? This is the cart login page, and this is the cart, or the, the you know, login page kind of things, and made things complicated. And I realized there, it just makes debugging harder. It makes it harder to figure out where you're at and see where you're going. And there's no driving reason to do it other than someone says, it works for me. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. And again, it's not you I'm worried about. It's the person who's trying to use what you're building after you leave. All right, constructors. This is a really advanced pattern I've seen some people really excited to do, and I did it at one of my companies, where the idea is when you're initializing a page object, let's do all of the things that it's going to take to make sure that we're in the exact right context for that page. It's a good idea. Like, I don't care necessarily how I get to the sign-in page. I need to sign in, and so I initialize it, and it's going to make sure that I'm in that context. That's, that's a good idea. What are your users going to do? They're going to store it in a variable, move somewhere else so that the state is lost, and then try and use that variable. So you had this clever way of making sure that you're in the right state, and then your users are just going to go, and it, but it was automatic, so it wasn't obvious that that's what was being done when you initialized it. Sign in new. This, there's nothing in here that says, we did a whole bunch of stuff to make sure you were where you needed to be. Uh, your users are going to store that. They're going to do something else. And usually, this isn't all on one page. It's passing things around between multiple page objects and things like that, or different parts of the test. And four lines later, you're not in the state you want, and you try to use the very like you can tell people don't put that into a variable. And again, your user is going to do that. So I do think navigation is important, but I like to be explicit about it. So I always implement a visit method. And again, I don't care how we get to the sign-in page. I just care that we're there. And so here's a way of let's navigate to the page, let's find the element we need and click it, and then let's uh, return an instance of that object. So this is a, a static uh, method that's returning an instance of, uh, or a class method that's returning an instance of uh, that method. So OK, but. How about we just reuse code that we already have? Because essentially, on the home page, we are going to visit, which is going to give us the it's going to navigate to testaddressbook.com, uh, and then we can just follow the sign in, which is essentially going to click the link. And now we're not re-implementing code in multiple places; we're just referencing those things. But even that, I already said we really don't care how we get there. 
Let's just navigate directly to it. Um, we can go even further uh, with some of these things. So like if you're trying to edit a specific uh, object, uh, you can get the ID and navigate directly to it based on various things. Uh, but the idea that when you're setting state, you're trying to do the minimal possible to get to that state most of the time. All right, so exceptions versus assertions. I see a lot of people putting assertion code in their page objects, which I discourage. So here's passing, failing, and an exception. My, how many people here use a JetBrains IDE? Huge fan of JetBrains. The results in JetBrains <coughs> passes, fails assertion, and raises an exception. So you get different information if it's a failed assertion than it's a raised exception. So you should treat what that does differently. Uh, the, nope. Think about it as an assertion is telling me that I w a failed assertion means I tested what I intended to test and it did not work. And an exception was I am unable to test what I want to test. So an exception is like I couldn't even get there. I couldn't set state. I couldn't, it was mostly I couldn't set state in order to take the action. If you can set state and take the action, then you should expect a failed assertion. And so this does get a little tricky. I'll talk about this a little bit more when it comes to error messages uh, here shortly. This one's controversial. I go back and forth on this. What I mean by defining success. Is success business logic or is it an implementation detail? So asserting a success criteria where you're saying login page, get the current user, have that be equal to my user. Now, delegating that success criteria to the page object is going to look like, hey, page object, am I logged in with that user? The difference here is I'm not specifying what logged in means, where here I am. Here I'm saying, find the text of this element and does it match the specific string that, I'm exp that I want to match? Where this is saying I have some user object, I'm going to pass it into a method, and it's going to come back true or false. This can vary depending on implementations and depending on context. Sometimes it's like, hey, if it changed from first, from first name only to first name last name, have you changed your business logic? N no, but you have to change the text of the test in order for it to pass now. Whereas if you consider that an implementation detail, matching text should be done in the page object. Uh, the way that I have kind of addressed this in my code is to create these uh, custom matchers where essentially I'm calling a specific method on the page object and it's coming back because the thing with this, the error message you're going to get is going to say, this was not true. It doesn't give you any additional information about why it wasn't true or anything like that. Where this, it's going to say, current user is Fred, and you expected it to be Bob. So it gives you exactly what, some more context to specifically what you're interested in. This is just going to say, expected true got false. I, I am currently of the opinion that this should be an implementation detail that's handled in the page object, but that you want to get, you have to do something to get more information back from the page object to make your error messages more useful. And so I do another step of creating custom matchers to be able to get that information back directly. There are a lot of people that will disagree with me on what this looks like. I've gone back and forth on it. All right, composition versus inheritance. I've seen some really ugly base pages. Um, does everyone know what a base page is? Essentially all your common code, everything that, that you, instead of copying and pasting it on a bunch of different pages, anything that all your pages do, let's just put it all in the super class. And so now your super class is, 
approximately 500,000 lines long. Um, no one can find anything on there. Uh, your find feature still finds you know, a dozen different matches for anything you could try and think of. Uh, you got all your comma actions, all your helper methods, all of whatever global weighting strategies you've implemented, and you should implement that. That's another talk. Uh, and pretty much anything that doesn't fit somewhere else, like let's just throw it all into this bag. A lot of the things that are in here can be abstracted away through some form of composition. And what I mean by that is, for instance, you can wrap your elements. This is one of the things that water does. Uh, essentially, you're initializing a water element with the instance of the selenium element. And you store that along with the locator for that element. Um, it allows you to store the cache once it's looked up. It allows you to uh, relocate as necessary, stale element, just rescue it, relook it up. It allows you to lazy load things uh, so that you're only locating when you're actually trying to take a specific action. It allows you to rescue all kinds of exceptions and deal with them and retry them things like that, makes it a lot easier to do some kind of synchronization. So the idea is anything that is element related in your base page, and you should have a lot of element related things in your base page, can all get pulled out and put outside of that. Another cool thing that you can do with this is subclassing for specific behaviors. Uh, as a tester, I can't think of any reason I would want to click a disabled button. Uh, Selenium allows you to do that. Selenium has no problem, which is fine. That's probably what, Selenium, that's probably what a browser automation tool should do. Uh, what about sending keys to an anchor element? Totally do that. No problem. Does it make sense? No. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to ask this question really quick. So grab your elements are you suggesting to do in the base class? I'm saying instead of putting a lot of the waiting strategies, synchronization, and um, custom methods and things like that in, the, in a base class, you can create a separate, a separate wrapped object somewhere else for your elements. It's like a, so instead of having a click method in your base page that does like a wait for element to be exist, wait for it to be displayed, and then click it, you could now initialize a separate element object, not have click in your base page at all, and then take click as a method on that element um, instance that you've uh, created, that kind of a thing. So you're just trying to pull stuff that's already polluting, that probably should be polluting your base page right now, and abstract that out into a separate type of a thing. So instead of putting everything in your inheritance, try and pull stuff out. Like, same thing with, I'm sure you have alert code in your base page, because everyone that deals with alerts, it has to come somewhere. It shouldn't belong in all your pages. Um, and some people do have helper, helper methods in your test code. I'll see that often. But again, is that test logic, or is that implementation logic with your driver? So again, figuring out where to put it. All of that does belong in your pages. But if you end up putting everything in a base page, you're going to have problems. So create an alert class, create a window class, create um, a cookies class, and have a way to interact with these different Selenium things uh, outside of just a global base page kind of a thing. Yeah. So oftentimes when I hear helper method, I'm hearing things that are included in your, the text of your test itself. Um, like Cucumber, you have world, RSpec, you have you know, your configure class or whatever. Essentially, you're populating your, your global namespace, as it were, or that huge namespace, with a whole bunch of helper methods and a whole bunch of things that is not the most object-oriented approach, because what object is this? It's in your, your world object. Um, it's much, and this is kind of where I'm saying, if you can wrap that and put that elsewhere, now you have the ability of, say, this element object, let me I can ev evaluate what state it has. I can evaluate things about it. I can take methods, or take actions on that element itself rather than, it's kind of the difference between having a method that's, um, you know, fill form kind of a thing versus object.fill form. You know exactly what's, what's on there. And there are a number of DSLs, especially in Ruby, uh, Cucumber, or sorry, uh, Capybara. Um, we'll do some of these things. You can do some of these things with it. Page object also has some of these. Let's populate the, the the default namespace with a bunch of methods, and now you, it's harder for you to debug into exactly what the method is doing, because it takes you 
outside of code that you've written and into uh, RSpec land, which gets very frustrating very quickly for me as a Rubyist. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question to a certain extent? So I'm saying do less with helper methods in your test code and try and create objects that you can take actions on um, external to that. So rather than putting it in a base page and rather than putting it into a helper method that you're importing into your, the, the text of your test, uh, try and reference objects that you can query state, that you can take actions on, and have it be a little bit more object oriented. Yeah, and we can talk more after if uh, you would like. So, um, so yeah, Selenium will let you send keys to an anchor element. It'll let you, uh, you know, do things that don't make sense to you. You can actually send keys to a read-only text element. You can't clear, but you can send keys to a read-only element. Which, again, as a tester, why would I do that? Um, I'm doing all the time. Yeah, we'll, we'll skip past that. All right. Um, so you could do some specific things. So if you are, if you're wrapping elements and creating separate elements, you can then create subclasses that have unique behavior depending. This is a text field. It can do different things. This is a button. It has different behaviors. And you can be more specific about what's allowed and what's not allowed. All right. Considering the intent of the method. This is another one that gets uh, a little contentious. So here's the idea. Oh. We're visiting our sign-in page. We're signing in with a valid user. And we're expecting the current user to equal that valid user's email. So we've got the sign in method in the page object, and that's just sending keys, the um, email, password, and clicking submit. Um, and then we've got our current user, which is just you know whatever the user element is, get the text. All right. What happens if we're trying to get this current, like when we hit this part here to get the current user, we get this. Everyone's familiar with the no such element error, right? How helpful is this stack trace right here? It's telling us it can't find current user. We, that's not the problem. That's not where we had the problem. The problem we had was in submitting the form somehow. It might be the step, it might be the, you know, like where in all of your code did that previous line happen? Was it in a different class, two methods before? Like what is it that, that um, actually caused the problem? So we get a no such element error with some random selector. We don't really know exactly what caused the problem. This is a simple example that's probably a little bit more obvious, but it can get much more complicated depending on how complicated your setup is. So the idea is what if we have an expectation attached to the method? Because we're expecting the end of this method to be successful, we can now Run out of battery. I think we'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll be fine. Uh, so we can do the same sign in method that we had before, but now we're going to, at the end of it, we're going to wait for us to not be on that page. So we're expecting when that, when that happened that we're going to be navigating to a different page, something like that. We can specify what we're changing. We could do something like this where we are, we are explicitly waiting for something to happen. And so if we get the timeout error, if we say, hey, we're still on the page after whatever our timeout is, well, let's rescue that. Let's, let's throw in a message that makes sense what happened. And what you put in this message can vary. But this is going to give you specific information with the stack trace that takes you right to where the problem is. That's going to say, and hey, maybe you even could put a method on there that looks for an error, like any element that has an error class because that's how your error messages are stored on your site. And you can just get a list of all of the errors that are on the page. Now, you don't have to look at a screenshot to figure out what happened. You don't have to spend a whole lot of time there. It's all right in your exception. So that kind of brings us to useful errors versus standard errors. So what is useful? Is this useful here? Unable to locate element xpath selector navbar slash div to slash span. One probably shouldn't be using xpath. If you are using xpath, please don't do this. This is literally a right click copy xpath on an element, 
And you would be surprised at how many people do that. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in this room because I know there are people in here that do that. Uh, well, what if you create a keyword for the element in your page object? And you can now say, unable to locate the element current user at this location kind of a thing. You can add all sorts of additional information there. If you are wrapping the element, you can say what kind of element it is. You can say if there was a Selenium element that was cached. You can give information about uh, what page object it was in. There's all sorts of stuff you can do to give yourself more information. The idea is you're going to decrease your overall time dealing with maintenance if you can at a glance see what's happening rather than having to spend time, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, trying to reproduce something or dig into it to see exactly what's going on. It might be easy enough like, ah, OK, this is where the problem is. This is what's going on. They changed that code. Let me update that locator, and we're done. I've, I've worked some really complicated uh, frameworks that trying to figure out what element matched a weird X path and trying to track it down to figure out how to fix it Hours of my life I can't get back. All right, so that's, that's what I have. Um, great, well, thank Bye -bye. you very much. Can we get a round? <laughs>